All right. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for joining. And let's talk parasites. <laughs> Thanks, Talia. One of my favorite topics. Uh, one of my girlfriends, actually, Dr. Michelle Paris, um, also a naturopath, she coined me the princess of parasites. And I feel like I just continue to try to wear that as a badge of honor now. The princess that, of parasites. That, yeah. <laughs> so Michelle P.P.P. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a bigger parasite princess. Yes. <laughs> and poop. Cause like my focus in clinic is digestive health, which is what kind of led me down the parasitic protocol, like parasite, like lane. So mm. it's just princess of poop and parasites and I don't know, other stuff. And the PPP. Just, yeah. Just <laughs> the poop. That's actually like a good marketing name though. The parasite pr poop and poop princess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And why? Okay. Parasite. How should we, should we launch into like, how did you come to be interested in parasites? Let's yeah. go there because sure. Yeah. So, so I've always struggled with digestive issues since university. I stressed myself out way too hard mm -hmm. and I did not know how to take care of my body. Even though I grew up in a house where we had like garden, fresh veggies. My mom gave us echinacea when we had a cold and things like that. Um, I was always addicted to sugar as a, as a kid. And that followed me into university years. So like I was hopped up on French vanilla cappuccinos from Tim Hortons and sucking down like Hershey's kisses was like, as I was stressed case in like McMaster university, grinding them, the Hershey's kisses <laughs> down between my tongue and the roof of my mouth. Just while I was studying, I was such a nutcase during that time. Um, <laughs> I was so stressed. Um, and then I would stay up late and I wasn't taking care of myself and I'd be crying all the time. And I would like, I was so in my head and then hopped up on sugar and caffeine mm. and not mm. taking care of myself. And then on the weekends, I'd work at a restaurant and then I would eat garbage food there and drink a glass of wine when you're a server. That's like how you decompress. So it was just this like accumulation of things where my digestion really fell apart. And it's taken me a really long time to fully understand the complexity of digestion and the mental emotional side didn't really hit me until maybe six or seven years ago, like really, really connected the dots for me about how much my stress and my emotions were affecting my digestion. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so, so it's taken me a while to kind of go through that. And during that journey, I was introduced to someone who does live, uh, blood cell microscopy. Um, and everyone has their opinions about this and, um, whether or not it's valid or not, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't matter to me because when I started working with this technician, I started, I found that it was started to help my clients in a remarkable way to understand these hidden things happening in the blood that no other test was telling me. It was starting to really like direct the course of action with my clients and start to get better results. And it was through Shannon Gregory. She owns this company. Now she's branched open because she's so good at what she does. And she's so passionate about microbiology and reading the blood that she's constantly trying to upgrade her skills. So she's um, she kept getting more referrals. So then she started to open side satellite clinics and she's created this company called Microcell Sciences now that kind of works in like Etobicoke, some of greater Toronto and into Hamilton area here in Ontario. And, uh, I learned about parasites from her and started to understand that she see things, she'll see things in the blood and it corresponds with people's symptoms in spite of them having gone to their doctors, gotten a poop test and told that there was nothing there. Right. And then she'll see things like ascariasis and worms and things laying egg, like where eggs were laid inside the red blood cells. And she could like literally look at a worm and try to quantify the time frame you've gotten it from because of the, the size it's gotten in the bloodstream and, and whether your liver is detoxifying well. And if you have other microbial issues and yeast and, you know, all these things. And, uh, they would, she would start to facilitate naturopaths or people who come to see her and she would treat them as well. And they would start to get better in spite of the poop test saying there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. And that was a very pivotal moment for me to understand that some of the tests that we've come to rely on might've been deficient mm -hmm. and they might not be telling us everything. So using live blood cell microscopy, um, with her and specifically, cause I find some these people take a weekend crash course or not always as like passionately well-versed as she is and the technicians she's trained learning through her has been pivotal, uh, for the onset of my parasite, like arc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh. And, uh, and after that, I just became really interested in it. Um, and she, you know, she introduced me to like 
physical energetics. And then they had really cool parasite stuff and homeopathics that were parasites that I found worked better than maybe some of the undas that we use traditionally as naturopaths. And then I just found that I was getting so much information. So I started looking into it a little bit further. Um, and that's kind of how it started. And it's, it's interesting because we don't really talk about it in naturopathic professions. Like even going to like, with my focus in digestive health, I would go to conferences and it would be about digestive health and it'd be like SIBO is the new craze and this and this and, and reflux and good, but nobody freaking talked about parasites. It's almost yeah. never talked about. And I was like, why is nobody talking about this more? So when I started connecting the dots and I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to start outsourcing information. So if I ever came across any kind of like small webinar or something, and even if they were attached to a company that was selling anti-parasitics, I still wanted to learn because it was giving me information that I wasn't getting with any of our traditional courses. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't give a crap about the product. I just want to understand what are the pieces of the puzzle we're missing when it comes to parasites. So um, it became a really big part of my practice. And I started to realize that because it was so ne not neglected, but like not as it wasn't given the weight it deserved. It was a big contributing factor to why some people were not getting better. Mm -hmm. If you weren't addressing this one aspect, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I found I wanted to continue in that journey. Yeah. Like we, what did we learn about it in school? Not much, right? It was like, it's almost like there's always a gut, like a root cause craze or a root cause theme for why right. someone has the typical gut health issues, right? Like I guess way back when at the beginning of our profession, it was parasites and candida was a thing. And yeah, by the time we were in school, it was all about SIBO or at least by the time I was in school or graduating yeah. and yeah, whatever happens to like what happened to those parasites everyone had a few decades ago, and they're still there. <laughs> yeah, and like we we're still selling parasite supplements, right? And I guess yeah, like so maybe could you explain what uh, live cell uh, microscopy is and like what? Oh yeah, yeah. What someone can see. Yeah. So live blood cell microscopy is basically taking your blood and looking at an under a microscope, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's kind of funny when people are like, "It's not valid." And I was like, "Well, don't we just do that for standard blood work?" Yeah. Aren't we looking at the actual <laughs> kind of the yeah. same thing, except yeah. with standard blood work, you are being asked to look at specific variables and that's all you're looking for. So you're ignoring everything else. You're centrifuging it. You're taking it just from the serum or from the red blood cell or this, and you're separating and isolating where live blood microscopy is almost naturopathic philosophy. It's very holistic. You're looking at the blood as is. Mm -hmm. while it's still alive because by the time it goes to the lab when you go to the when you, you know once your blood's drawn from a traditional it's it's inert it's dead like things aren't moving you're not going to see life right so when you do live blood microscopy it's like in the moment so you take a finger prick and for hopefully you're using a very high definition microscope and that's what uh microcell sciences use they use very expensive microscopes to be able to understand the details um, and then for the client, you sit there while they're doing the observations and it's projected onto a computer screen. So you can see what is being seen on the microscope. And they'll literally tell you, this is a white blood cell. It's really healthy. You have enough of, of those, or you have a lot of white blood cells and there's a good volume based on the microbes, but your white blood cells are just sitting there. They're not actually addressing the microbial burdens. Mm -hmm. That that dynamic was something that I was like, that's what I don't get from a, from a static white blood cell count, mm -hmm. neutrophil count, lymphocyte count on a standard blood work. It's mm -hmm. the dynamic of things. And that's where I started to understand that. So they're watching how fast your blood cells are moving, like your red blood cells are moving across the screen at the beginning. Are they clumped together? That tells different things about the level of stress or inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. um, it's what, it's probably the same thing why we have ESR at, at erythrocyte sedimentation rate to regulate, to understand inflammation. So this is another way of doing that, right? if things are clumped or moving or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, it showed me the dynamic of things in addition to the qu like quantities. Um, and then it would also, what I find it's most helpful for is, um, whether or not the liver is clearing the plasma, cause that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to clean the plasma. And if there's a lot of garbage mm -hmm. behind the red blood cells in the plasma, then that starts to indicate that perhaps your liver is not cleaning things out and filtering things out as effectively as it should be, which is really key for any kind of detoxification, microbial or otherwise. Um, and then you can see yeast spores really well, parasites, microscale, microcell scientists have been able to like um, find new ways to understand uh, bacterial burdens as well. So it's not just the volume of bacteria, but how 
how long, how much they've integrated themselves into your system. Is it just an acute infection or is it something that's actually started to like hijack your cells and even start to change or allow your cells to morph because of the bacterial mm -hmm. load? So they've done some really cool things. I remember the day Shannon messaged me. She's like, I have 20 textbooks out and I think I figured it out. And she was so <laughs> excited about the bacterial burden. So um, that's why I always send to them. Um, but that's basically what live blood is. It's just looking at it. As in a moves. holistic way, mm -hmm. as it moves, looking at how things are interacting with your white blood cells, microbes, red blood cells, et cetera. And then just seeing what's there without isolating, separating and segregating, and then just only looking for one thing, mm -hmm. right? Now you're looking at the totality of things, which I find is very naturopathic mm -hmm. in, in essence, right? Is like, how do we, how do we look at things in context rather than taking one variable out of context and making a weird assumption about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do we look at the ecosystem essentially, exactly. right? Like as, as it exists, as it would exist in your blood, in your body yeah. and blood. Yeah. yeah. And, and since then, you know, I've done some stuff like GI 360 tests and I've also have a biofeedback test that I use or bioenergetic biofeedback testing that I was available at my Georgetown office. And I find that also tells me different types of uh, that has different value because mm -hmm. it's also not specific to location. Um, so that's something else we could talk about, uh, about mm -hmm. parasites when it comes to testing eventually to, uh, just the differences between them and yeah. And uh, how to test. Yeah. Cause that's yeah. a big thing. I think, right. It, maybe that's why parasite testing and like intervention has fallen out of fashion is because a lot of people rely on the stool tests, particularly yeah. the ones that like Life Labs does, like the $30 or whatever, the cheap ones that almost always are negative. Like, I don't think I've ever heard of one coming back positive. And, and so the assumption, I guess, and even what I assumed was like, ah, oh, we don't really, it's not really an issue, especially in yeah. North America, which is a little yeah. bit absurd if I, if I think about it, because we travel all the time, you know? Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of assumptions about mm -hmm. parasites that are not really rooted in reality. <laughs> <laughs> Good way of putting it. Yeah. So first of all, like just for our listeners, a parasite is basically a, an organism that requires a host for nutrition and survival. So mm -hmm. they need to jump into a host. They need you. And they are very smart about hijacking your body. Mm -hmm. um, just to give like a bit more of like a, like an overview it's estimated that maybe upwards to 70 people have some sort of parasitic infest infestation um, or Disgusting. probably even more in all <laughs> fairness, because testing is so lame that maybe we're still not even able to like understand really the breadth of like the infection. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot, there's a lot of different kinds and 30% of them are microscopic. Mm -hmm. So, so you're not always going to see them coming out in your poops as well. Um, so, so, so there's, and if they're microscopic, that means they can embed themselves deeper into your system, which means they're not always going to just stay in your colon. Mm -hmm. They might decide that they want to go inside your red blood cells instead. Mm -hmm. So like you said, how, yeah, you can see their eggs. That's horrific. That's another reason why maybe we avoid parasites. It's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, no, it really does create a very visceral response when I start yeah. to try to bring up the parasite stuff and like how pervasive they are, how invasive they are. They can live in your red blood cells, between your cells, in your tissues. They don't just hang out in your colon. And I think that's a big assumption mm -hmm. or a misunderstanding or, or just like, I don't even know what the right word is, but I feel like. Uh, the conception is like, it's a worm, like a tapeworm. Like it's a big Oh yeah. Long... Everyone's head always goes to tapeworm right away, right. you know? Um, so they're not just going to sit there in your intestinal tract and like, in the intestines, they can lay eggs and those lay, those eggs could very well travel to the rest of your body. And I, and, and I learned about that with live blood too, where she was like, the, like certain types of like ascariasis and stuff can lay eggs. Those can travel in your red blood cells. And sometimes they have an affinity for the lungs and breed there. Like they can be anywhere. And I know that sounds really gross, but I feel like we need to, we need to, mm -hmm. as cringy as it is, we need to start <laughs> having honest conversations about things that actually matter. Like mm -hmm. we can't just go through this world, like as if it's sunshines and rainbows and ignore important facts. Right. Cause True. I feel like that has led us astray many times over and we need to start <laughs> just dealing yeah. with the reality. It's time, to, it's time to step up and look parasites in the face. Uh, maybe not, it. maybe don't look <laughs> them in the face there. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is also where I think because of traditional standard medical testing we're not necessarily finding the the like 
the proper, the, the, we're not really addressing the full inventory of microbes that could be in somebody's body. Mm -hmm. So what I have found is if you're number one, p parasites will have different life cycles. So with those standard life labs, gamma dinocare, ova and stool parasitic tests, uh, ova and parasite stool tests, they're, I don't think their sensitivity and specificity, like, I think they have a very, uh, hmm. from what I understand, they have a very small list of things that they're really looking for. The things that have been deemed pathogenic, according to the CDC or ministry of health or whatever. And it's like, it's a very brief list. And that's hmm. all they're looking for. Cause if I've gotten them back, it says no signs of this. And it lists just a handful of parasites. And I was like, well, there's more than that. There's like, Mm -hmm. thousands of different types of parasites people can have. So if you're only listing, looking for 10, then we're probably not really catching a big enough net. Number right. one, if the test isn't very sensitive, then it might not pick up a parasite at specific parts of its life cycle. So if a doctor is not sending a client home with three different tests and asking them to space it like five to seven days apart, so you could try to catch a different parts of your life cycle and you're only sent one test, there's a very good chance that you're also missing the window of opportunity to really like find it based on the type of test they're using and the type of testing standards they have for that. So that's one thing that I find very deficient with that. We can bump it up to like naturopathic standards where we have things like GI 360s and GI map tests and very comprehensive stool analyses where we're ca we're casting a bigger net um, mm -hmm. and our sensitivity level for the, with the type of testing strategies we have is more sensitive to being able to identify and catch more. Now, some people say that that might actually create more false positives by, based on what's in the poop. And then I still think that there's still going to be some false ne negatives because it's still a poop test. Mm -hmm. So it's still not going to find something that's like chilling in your red blood cells in your lungs necessarily, or a liver fluke that's hiding in your liver and gallbladder ducts, right? Or even so, something that's attached to your colon wall, right? Like if, as long as it's not ending up in your poop. Yeah. Right. What if it's your small intestines mm -hmm. and it's hanging out there and it's found a good home, mm -hmm. right? So I think that some people say those create false positives because it's more like, um, uh, the, t the PCR testing. So if, you know, it might be almost oversensitive with finding DNA. Um, but then also I'm saying the sample size is still very narrow mm -hmm. where it's really more location specific. So it's still not catching enough of a net for what's happening in the rest of the body. Yeah. So that's where live blood has been interesting. Cause now it's shown me what's bypass, what's, what's breached the wall of the intestines. Cause that's usually it's fecal oral. It's usually like oral route that we're getting them. Although we can absorb things through the skin, which means it's not going to hide in your intestines. Mm -hmm. You could be walking barefoot on grass and get something like it's, it's part of living life. Right. Which is also, why I'm just kind of like get ancestrally lungs, ancestors yeah, eyes, knew this. they had to yeah. do parasite cleanses like ancestrally like once a year because it's just a part of living in harmony with this world because a parasite need a ho needs a host and we are really good hosts right like mm -hmm. so um just like animals what we deworm you know cattle mm -hmm. and we deworm dogs regularly why are we not doing the same thing for ourselves like they're not the only ones that are living in this world it's You're so living funny with too, them. like, yeah, I know in <laughs> like if you Google parasites and like, yeah. like you'll see a lot of campaigns in India about like twice yearly deworming of everybody in the country, essentially, especially children. And then when I lived in Colombia, it was a practice to get yearly or bi-yearly parasite, like cleanse it, like go on um, yeah. parasite yeah. protocols, even in the major cities. So like in the mm -hmm. rural, rural areas for sure, but even the major cities. And for some reason, and this is the cognitive dissonance around it, even though I lived there, I was in contact with the same environment as people who are whose practice it is to do yearly parasite purging. I was like, oh, but I don't need to because I'm North American. There was something cognitively like, what is that? Is that just this, oh, so like, this message that like, depending on where you live, maybe it's the, the fact that we have winters, but I don't know. There's just this message that I think we received around how... I don't know. There's no parasites. I don't know. It was, it was bizarre. It's, I, know, yeah. I, th I think like there's like, well, number one, I think the, the types of tests people are mostly exposed to, if they're not seeing a naturopath and working with a naturopath, then there's a big discrepancy between 
uh, the reality of parasites and what they perceive on tests. Yeah. So then I think there's this idea that I'm fine. And yeah. then there's this idea that you can just take Ducarol when you go to the Caribbean or Mexico or somewhere south of the border for a vacation where the sanitization of water is maybe a little bit more questionable or they don't have the same stand, not questionable, they don't have the same standards as we do in North America. Um, so people take Ducarol and it's like, do you think that just creates a magical force field around you? Like right. you can still get infected, but the real purpose is for it to like allow you to have a more robust immune response. So that if you come in contact with something, your body's able to purge it more. It doesn't mean you, you don't get infected. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big misconception. So people are like, oh yeah, I went to Mexico and I, I always ask about traveling now. And food yeah. poisoning with all my clients, food poisoning because of SIBO, but travel because, you know, any kind of infection can lead to SIBO, but also what is your travel history? Um, and all the people were like, oh yeah, everybody around me had food poisoning, but I was fine. I was like, yeah, you probably still have a parasite. Maybe your body's less effective at purging it. If everyone had, yeah. in fact, I swear, if everyone had the shits around you, they were probably <laughs> purging it more effectively than you. If you were also infected and then your body didn't actually eliminate it effectively, yeah, your body that's, didn't a, you know, yeah. you know, like that's part of why our body has like vomiting and diarrhea to get rid of the garbage that is foreign, a foreign invader that does not belong. That's mm -hmm. part of the reason why we do that. So, um, I think there's misconceptions around that. And I think that people think that they need to have gone somewhere that is a, uh, less sanitary country to have acquired mm -hmm. a parasite. Like I haven't gone to Africa or I took all the malaria pills. So like I couldn't have possibly, or you know what I mean? Or I've never been to Southeast Asia and I've never traveled to Mexico and I've only been to Canada. So, you know, it, we, we have this weird idea that because of our hyper sanitization practices that we are, you know, mm -hmm. immune to those type of things, but yeah, um, we import and export food. Yeah, we I was travel. Say, yeah, we travel all the time. And mm -hmm. if you're not the one traveling, but your partner is, they could be harboring fugitives. And if you're swamping spit with them, then there's there's also a nice way of being able to like mm. spread that. If you have pets, they're great vectors for parasites. If you live in this world, yeah, and you have a pulse, yeah, you are going to be exposed to parasites on a regular basis. Do not go live in a bubble because part of our existence is to be able to live in harmony with the world around us. And I think part of us forget that. And we think that if I wash and over sanitize and bleach and this and that, that, and and then, mm -hmm. then I feel like it creates this false sense of like security. Mm -hmm. And then you neglect that you're still of this world. Mm -hmm. And you're and we, also, you're not selectively removing what's bad and keeping the good. You're right. removing everything that's lowering right. your defenses. Like we can't, it just doesn't work that way. No. So, yeah. so, so I think that's why there's a lot of misconceptions about parasites. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's why it's not addressed as regular, regularly as it should be. It's not tested for as strategically as it should be. And I don't think there is a perfect test for parasites because if we're just relying on poop samples, again, we're not, we're not seeing how it's affecting the rest of the body however if it's showing up in the poop then there's a good there's a good assumption that could be more in the blood as well yeah. um yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. That, that it yeah it's like and so where would someone start like what are the common symptoms that would make you suspect someone's dealing with parasites someone comes to see you. i mean maybe people seek you out because they resonate with the idea of parasites yeah <laughs> Maybe I think, I think yeah. people seek me out because yeah, I've had people seek me out specifically for parasite stuff because mm -hmm. they've been curious or they've have all these weird symptoms, but, uh, nobody can seem to understand, but they're like, I swear it happened since I came back from this trip or I swear it happened after. So they'll seek me out because of that to get a little bit more comprehensive understanding and testing and, and with some of the different tools that I use. Um, and, uh, yeah. So some of the, some of the symptoms though, is a lot of people think that it's going to be digestive specific. And there is like, you can definitely get the gas, the bloating, you can get, um, uh, unexplained nausea and vomiting. Um, we can get hmm. any of those like common IBS like symptoms can be related to parasites. Now it could also be related to other microbes, but they all live in a symbiotic environment. So they all kind of like they kind of roll in a posse and they all protect each other. So like it could be more than just the bacteria that need to be addressed. And the parasites are a big missing piece of that. But it goes beyond just digestive stuff mm. because these freeloaders, as I like to call them, eat up your nutrients and excrete their own waste into your body. 
And then that waste can also contribute to uh, toxic burdens, immune dysregulation, inflammation, and nutrient depletions, which can manifest in a myriad of ways in people. So for some people, it might look like skin rashes or hives. And I started seeing a lot of like, hmm like skin issues with some of my parasitic or like weird unexplained itching that like I'm just itchy all the time. Right. Um, that kind of stuff. If you clench your teeth at night and bruxisms and teeth grinding, um, migraines and chronic headaches could be part of it. Joint pain can be a part of parasites. Um, weight issues. So weight loss, excess, extreme weight loss, or difficulty losing weight could also be a problem, especially mm -hmm. if your toxic burden's higher because of this. Um, a lot of fatigue because of nutrient depletions. Um, parasites love iron. A lot of microbes also have an affinity for heavy metals specifically. And iron is a metal and in extreme mm -hmm. amounts, it's also considered toxic for our system. Um, but Parasites can actually like hijack your cells and lie dormant in your cells and just like use up your nutrients for decades before you might even exhibit symptoms. And you might just be like, I'm just tired all the time. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it could be a big cause of anemias that is being under like, un like not looked at effectively. Yeah, so you're like, you're supplementing, 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 and you're really just feeding me. And now you're feeding the beef. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're paying so, like a hundred bucks a month to, yeah, totally. Your so, parasites. Yeah. So they love iron. They also love to rob you of B12. So that could lead to the fatigue. It could lead to micro microbial issues. It can actually flare up latent viruses to have parasitic infections. So sometimes maybe EBV or anything like that might be flared because of parasitic infections. You might have more food cravings for sugar. Um, you might have brain fog, mood swings, anxieties, depressions, Rectal itching is a really big one too. But one of my favorite things to always ask people is um, if their symptoms are always worse, A, at night or around a full moon. And yeah. it sounds very witchy, but there's some logic to this. Mm -hmm. Parasites are typically more active at night um, and they can release cortisol. They can, because of their activity, they, they, they can affect our stress response. And sometimes people's issues might be more uh, apparent at night because of the higher level of activity that they have, but it could also disrupt their sleep pattern. So sometimes I find when people have insomnia, I often think, is their cortisol too high? Is their stress response kicking in? But parasites can be part of why your stress response is kicking in. Mm -hmm. And that might be the only reason, but a con contributing factor to why cortisol levels might be higher at night. Mm -hmm. um, and then the whole full moon thing is because around the full moon, the moon does have a total effect on us, just like it has an effect on the tides. We are not immune to the effects of like the poles of the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, around the full moon, a lot of people don't sleep well. One is because it actually limits our melatonin production around the full moon mm -hmm. and melatonin actually plays a really important role with also our immune health antioxidant health so not only are we sleeping less effectively it will also lower our immune system so now it creates an environment in which parasites can thrive a little bit more or come out of hiding um and then also our serotonin levels increase a little bit around the full moon and parasites are attracted to serotonin so that'll also draw them out and so they become more active so if you find all your symptoms are worse around a full moon that could actually be a reason why that's interesting yeah. scientifically. And it's not just yeah. like witchy woo woo. It's not just like, <laughs> yeah. Werewolf type stuff. Yeah. yeah. What about like behavior issues, mood stuff in children? Cause I yeah. know this is something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say yes. Cause if mm -hmm. they're dumping like, it, you know, they're going to disrupt your immune system. They're going to disrupt your inflammatory response. It's going to make you crave mm -hmm. sugar. It's going to make you you know, which can make kids erratic when the sugar's off. It can also, like I already alluded to, like it likes to hang in a posse with other microbes. So if it's causing dysregulation and other microbial issues, we already know that your gut microbiome has a huge connection to mood and behavior from the gut brain access. Yeast will probably could also be increased around parasites. And when kids eat sugar, um, and they have an overgrowth of yeast, you'll release acetaldehyde, which is toxic. And it can make kids act like they're drunk and like more erratic. Mm -hmm. So there's a few different things that it might not be the parasites, but it could be parasite adjacent because of everything kind of in tandem, but also just because the inflammatory, the immune response, the garbage response, the nutrient depletions, like that's not an environment in which somebody can self-regulate very well, including mm -hmm. kids. And like part of the reason I want to talk to you is my friend and I are talking about her, her daughter, mm. about three years old and has so many of these symptoms. Um, 
like really sweet, creative, like gregarious kid who will have these like screaming fits <laughs> that don't turn off. Like it's almost like something's attacking her. Uh, weird appetite. And um, her dad, my friend's partner, was saying that there's like almost like an alcohol or like a sweet um, smell on her breath sometimes. Mm. And it almost reminds me of this acetaldehyde or like some yeah. sort of like uh, thing that's dying off or, or a chemical is being produced. And so even like weird smells on the breath or weird tastes in the mouth might be something. You know? It could it could be yeah. even just yeasty. Yeah, it yeah, parasi- yeah. It could be parasitic, but it could also just be yeast. It could but be yeast. food sensitivities. It could be all of the above, mm-hmm. right? Because like leaky gut causes leaky brain. We know this as naturopaths. Parasites are going to contribute to leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Um, They're not going to make it better. That's for sure. They're going to be a big contributing factor to allowing that to continue um, unregulated or, or more, you know, it'll be more difficult to overcome a leaky gut if you still have microbes that are just like Mm -hmm. irritants Mm -hmm. in your system. So it could be. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I find, yeah. Uh, especially like the fatigue or excessive allergies, cause parasites will also exacerbate our eosinophils, um, mm-hmm. from our immune response and eosinophils also contribute to our allergic response and our allergic mm-hmm. defenses. So sometimes I find exacerbations of allergies could also be parasitic related. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause that's the one way our body tries to like combat parasites, right. With uh, histamine. So a lot of like histamine symptoms, hives, yeah. like itchiness, yeah. swelling, and irritability. Then, like, and that makes you like, think about like people who have histamine intolerance and stuff. Mm-hmm. It, you know, we talked about SIBO and things, but we're still, nobody talks about the parasite side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I want to, yeah. If there's like an underlying parasitic infection, then all, everything else is going to get thrown off, right? You're, you're not going to be clearing or like yeah. your motility might be thrown off. Then you're not moving your bacteria through your system. Yeah. And I get, it's hard for sometimes people to justify because there's no perfect test to really quantify, mm-hmm. you know, I've had to, I've had to color outside the lines when Mm -hmm. it, you know, when it comes to testing or looking at different options for testing to really help me understand what's happening on a more comprehensive level rather than just location specific. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've had to, and I've been open to looking at different things and trying it out. And, you know, if it, if it helps me get the results and my clients get better, then Mm -hmm. I'm here for it. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah, like there's no perfect way to like 100% no. confirm. Yeah. You're using what, like we often do as NDs though, right? We're always pulling different pieces of data mm-hmm. and, and using our intuition or clinical experience and the patient's experience and intuition and, and sort of figuring out, okay, what's a map of what could be going on? Where do we start? How do we, how do we like, what thread do we untangle or pull on first yeah. to help them feel better? It's never about one thing in isolation. Mm-hmm. It's always about, you know, all the moving parts and how everything contributes to everything else. So that's where like a really good intake comes in, understanding digestion of issues, seeing what kind of tests they've already done. You're not going to find parasites on an endoscopy or a colonoscopy or that you're not going to find them that way. So just because you had a colonoscopy and one lame, for lack of better words, poop test with your doctor doesn't mean you're parasitic free. Mm -hmm. And -hmm. especially if you have these weird lingering symptoms. And I've had people come to me and like, my doctor just says I have post-infectious IBS after like years of diarrhea and no enter- gastroenterologist has been able to identify things. Oh, I did a parasite test. Oh, I did this. Oh, I did this. And I was like, okay, can we try some of my testing? And like, lo and behold, they're like riddled with garbage. And now the person's like, yeah, I don't have to walk around in fear mm-hmm. of pooping my pants and having to always look for where the closest bathroom is. He mm-hmm. was like, my quality of life has shot up dramatically. Right. Mm-hmm. And the most expert gastroenterologist in the GTA completely missed that part of the puzzle. I'm yeah. like, no, no shot, like, you know, not to like, sh- you know, take a shot at them, but like, they're great at what they do, but they still miss some really vital pieces of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. It's just not I'm on sorry. their radar. It's not, it's not like on their radar yeah. because they're not trained to look for it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? And it's, just, it's, 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 it's part, part of the lack of training they have on those specific things, just like we did. I had to yeah. do my extra legwork for this. Yeah, same. It wasn't, it's not, it, until very recently, it wasn't really on my radar no. to the extent that it should have been. Um, yeah. And I, like, again, like I said, I lived in South America and had parasites, like, you know. Mm-hmm. And, but let's talk about the heavy metals for a second, because I know that, and that is relevant to people in North America or I guess everywhere in the world, like the exposure we have of these toxic metals and how that can like perpetuate infections by feeding parasites and vice versa. Like, how does that connection exist or like is that something that you yeah I mean I find it's I find it's uh it's almost bi-directional 
having mm-hmm. an increase in amount of heavy metals in your body will create an environment that will attract these microbes and kind of like sequester them a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But also I find parasites will also hold on to heavy metals as well. So it's kind of like a, who knows what came first, the fish mm. it doesn't really matter if they're both there, then, then we want to. And if someone has an, a, a really high amount of parasites and you also want to maybe do some heavy metal testing as well to ensure that there isn't anything lingering because at the end of the day, it is about the terrain, mm. right? So I can talk about heavy metal cleansing all I want and that's great, but not every parasite and heavy metal parasite cleansing all I want, but not every parasite is going to be a problem either. But if people are coming to me with symptoms, then obviously it's reached the point that it's a problem. So we need to like get in there, guns blazing, you know, reset the, reset the terrain, like reset the microbiome, um, microbiological terrain and like the microbial terrain. But I also need to then strengthen the terrain in every other aspect. So I think the reason why number one, like these are becoming more pervasive or more of a problem is number one, there's a huge denial (laughs) about how pervasive they are for, as for all the reasons we've already discussed. Um, I think because they gross people out. So mentally, emotionally, (laughs) people have their own sense of denial outside of the medical world. There's avoidance. Yeah. Like a huge avoidance. Totally. (laughs) It's undiscussed. Yeah. It's like all the (laughs) stages of grief, isn't it? Like (laughs) anger, denial, (laughs) rage. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, and then I think the other thing too, is that we don't live a healthy life in this world. So if we think about the exponential amount of chemicals that we've been exposed to, so our chemical burden on our body has exponentially increased. A lot of people come to me because they have constipation. So your detoxification pathway is already compromised. So how are you going to get rid of a parasite if you can't poop? Because that's usually the main exit strategy for getting rid of these things, right? So people have compromised digestive function. People have compromised detoxification function. They eat a garbage filled diet of processed foods, chemicals, inflammatory oils, which creates an environment that allows these things to thrive. Mm -hmm. Um, There are pollutants and hidden chemicals and like heavy metals and stuff in so many things. And a lot of people are still suffering from like lead and paint in their homes from back in the day. And they maybe have never been guided on how to properly get rid of that garbage from their body. So there's that. A lot of people drink alcohol. We take antibiotics. We're excessively stressed. We don't sleep well. They don't exercise. All of this, all of that creates an environment that allows not just parasites, but a lot of pathogenic or opportunistic microbes to just latch on and thrive. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. the way we live our lives here in North America with this, this idea of like a abundance and affluence and leisure and convenience and whatever, it's not serving us in our health in so many ways. But if you want to try to address your microbiome balance, you need to start approaching your health in a different way as well. It's not just about killing the bugs. And I want to be very clear about that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So when you, yeah, when you're working with someone, is there a hierarchy that you start at? Like, I, I would assume getting someone pooping is like uh, the yeah. utmost priority for, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> First and foremost, you need to poop every day. Absolutely. Every day, people. Yeah. Every day. And if you can poop more than once a day, even better. But I find if I can get you pooping every day regularly, a full, complete void, not like still not to the point where you're straining and like having to like, and then you mm-hmm. only like release a nugget. That's not proper pooping still. Yeah. Um, more than a nugget. Yeah. <laughs> you need more than a nugget. We need a log. Um, then I, I feel more comfortable. However, that being said, if we, we need to open up the drainage pathways. So somebody can come to me completely fearful of parasites and being like, I think I have them. Can we test? And let's say we test. But I'm just like, we're going to start with your liver health first. And they'll be like, but what about the bugs? I was like, we're going to get, they're not going anywhere and we're going to get to them. But I cannot in good conscience Mm -hmm. try to flush things out of your body. If your primary detoxification organ that allows you to optimally flush things out of your body and process the garbage well is not working in your favor. If your lymphatic system is congested and congested, then we've got to support that. So I typically like to work on opening drainage pathways first. Are you peeing adequately? Are you well hydrated? Are you sleeping well? Because that's a big deal too. Your body can't heal if you're not sleeping well. Um, do I suspect some liver and gallbladder issues? And gallbladder has now become a really big part of my practice because there's a mm-hmm. lot of issues there. And then part of what led me to that was because a lot of liver flukes 
Um, and parasites that have an affinity for the liver and gallbladder can plug up the ducts and lead to more stones and poor bile flow and all this stuff. So parasites also lead to poor detoxification in addition to you needing to optimize detoxification to get rid, get rid of parasites. So it just becomes, you gotta, you kind of have to prioritize how you approach this and then, uh, making sure the lymphatic system is moving well. And are you feeding the, do you have a, a diet high in like sugars and garbage? Like, do you rely on caffeine all day, every day to get you through the, we have to work on other things. If someone's exhausted and extremely stressed out, I am not jumping into a detox protocol with them. Like period. Mm -hmm. You have nothing left to give. Do you think your body's gonna be able to rally for you to get rid of garbage? Probably not. It's like that right? idea of like excess and deficiency, right? So like, yeah. deficiency, like you don't have enough nutrients, enough sleep, enough food, calories. That's it. And then the exit, like you got to like replenish deficient uh, deficiencies yeah. first. Yeah. And I find that that's a hard conversation with people. Cause when they see the results have parasites, they're like, Oh my God, how, how fast can we get rid of them? And mm -hmm. I was like, well, first we got to take the right steps at the right time. Otherwise you're going to feel like garbage going through this process. And I would prefer that you still be able to have a decent quality of life in spite of parasite cleansing. Yeah. So, so, you know, when you kill them off, they also release their own garbage into your body. So again, that's why your drainage pathways and your detox pathways need to be open and prepped because otherwise it could cause a worsening of symptoms and, you know, it's the right step at the right time. You don't build a 15 foot building by starting with the, with the roof. You start mm -hmm. by building a good foundation and then you work your way up from there. And the same thing goes for any kind of de proper detox protocol, whether it's heavy metals, parasites, mold, yeast, bacteria, I don't care what it is. The person's body needs to be capable of doing the work mm -hmm. and you got to mm -hmm. prep it. Yeah. And yeah. Otherwise you feel terrible because that's a big part of it, right? It's like this die off reaction where it floods yeah. the system and the body's like, okay, just get those parasites back where they yeah. were because, <laughs> and yeah. those heavy metals. Because... Like what if someone has like extreme joint pains? Mm -hmm. I can't make them feel more debilitated through this process. Mm -hmm. What if they have eczema and, and psoriasis? There's always a good chance that your skin being a, an organ of detoxification is going to show a little bit worse before it gets better. But if I could minimize that for someone's quality of life, for, for them to effectively feel that their quality of life is better, but me also internally knowing that this is also better for their body's ability to get rid of these things. But for them, from a symptom perspective, it will create less exacerbations. So that's kind of how I position it for my clients, even though internally, I'm just kind of like, this is just the right step at the right time so that we don't create a secondary problem. Mm -hmm. Got it. The yeah. Process, right. Yeah. It's like our, yeah. Like our, our kind of therapeutic order, if you will, of like yeah. address nutrient deficiencies, make sure that the body can like handle what's going on and make sure yeah. your, uh, amunctories are open. Totally. Um, can we talk about liver flukes for a second? I don't know that there's got to be some intuitive thing going on, but I'm like drawn to the idea. Um, I saw this might be t TMI for everyone listening, but I saw I some TMI. like what looked like, um, yeah, never. <laughs> We're going to talk about poop. Bring it. Yeah. <laughs> like I saw some what looked like tomato skin uh, in my poop. And I was like, okay, like, and then I started, I was like, oh, but did I even have tomatoes that would have a skin <laughs> in the last I don't know, week or so. And then I started researching and finding out maybe it could be liver flukes being passed. I don't know oh, if that's something you see, but what, yeah, tell us about liver flukes. I don't see it in my own poop, but yeah, like okay. and uh, the clients, are, you know, because people already have a hard time with poop talk. People mm -hmm. be like, and the, they, they also preface it in, in private, in my office. I don't know if this is too much information, but, and I was like, just lay all your cards out, man. You're not like, otherwise yeah. we're past the point of like having, being shy with uncomfortable conversations. You're here to talk to me about your poop and your parasites. Um, but not like people aren't sending me pictures of what they see. And, um, so, so, so it could, it could, it could be, I haven't personally seen them in my own poops. And even when I've done parasite cleansing, I'm not sitting there with two chopsticks, like breaking open my poop to see if there's anything hidden inside, because you're like, if it's hidden in the log, you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So unless you're like dissecting yeah. your feces on a regular basis, you might not always see them. So I personally have not seen the liver fluke in a poop, but I've had people come back and say they saw something that looked like it. And when they would Google search it, they're like, that to that's totally what it looked like. So I'm just kind of like, great. And it was showing up on their, on their test results. So I was like, then it, then it probably is. And it's better out than in. And they had like a really good reaction and then they felt better after releasing it. So I was like, hmm. Yeah. Breaks. So it's more Breaks. like a like symptom or manifestation of a process right. that there's way more evidence for yeah. that's happening as opposed to like relying on this. Yeah. I mean, there can be like 
there's sort of like a this online world where people are super fascinated with their poops, especially their kids' poops. Um, <laughs> I, know. Like... I don't. <laughs> I have a client of mine who has, I think, the the most pervasive case of parasites I've ever had, and she sought me out because of my my world, my interest in this, and uh, she is diehard about dissecting her poop almost every day. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I am still finding a mass amount of worms, which brings me to my next topic that it's not just going to take a two week cleanse to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can take sometimes nine months. Might take a year. Because if you've never addressed this, then again, there's prep work to get your body mobilizing things. Then there's, then there's maybe the parasitic cleanses. You might have to take a pause to allow your gut to rest and reseed the microbiome, go again. Um, And it can take years. And the stuff that's going to come up first is the bigger stuff. The stuff that's maybe just living in the tubing of your intestinal tract. It's Mm. the microscopic stuff that's going to take longer to come out because it's more deeply burrowed into your system Mm -hmm. and you're not going to see it. You're not going to see it come out in your poop either. So that's where people start to be like, I guess I'm done. (laughs) So to do it properly, I would say everyone should at least do it properly with like guided by a naturopath or a functional medical doctor who understands what they're doing and do it completely. And then after that, I would say like, like you were saying in Colombia and stuff, they do it yearly. Mm. Like we do to our dogs yearly do maybe like a three to four week Mm. once a year or once every two years, just to ensure that, you know, things are still being kept in check and things haven't been allowed to fester and, and, you know, go into stealth yeah. mode beyond what we would want them to. So, um, but yeah, that could have very well, um, mm-hmm. could have been a liver fluke. That makes sense. Yeah. And what you're saying too about like, I mean, it, you can imagine if someone's had, like if these parasites have been in there taking up residence, you know, sorting themselves out and, and holding up in your body for years, then it's probably yeah, going to take longer if they've, you know, gotten into all the different tissues, blood cells yeah. themselves. Yeah. It's yeah. probably going to be a while before that stuff can like, yeah. uh, purge that before you regenerate new red blood cells and make, you know, that are free of eggs and just, yeah. Like, so, <laughs> so like when it comes to the trajectory of like how I would approach this is like, a, do I have to open up the among trees first? Are they pooping? Am I suspicious about the liver? But I almost always keep something underlying for liver support throughout the process, just to make sure their bodies effectively Mm -hmm. flushing and processing just as an FYI for some people, depending on how their sensitivity level, as I get to know them and uh, how pervasive things are or how bad their symptoms are, there's a very good chance at the beginning, I'll definitely add a binder in to ensure that it like mops up and like contains garbage that it can get pulled out of the body more effectively. Um, So parasite protocols can, can, can get multi-layered and then, you know, you might, you're going to want to address that various moving parts at the same time, which means that, you know, it can feel a little bit heavy handed on, on this, the stuff that you have to take. Um, but I always try to remind people that it's temporary. It's just so that we can get to the other side. And I don't want people just to be taking a mil- you know, like volumes of things for an extended period, but I don't need to do my job well so that they don't feel worse through the process and that we actually address things more completely. Um, so there's that. And like I said, that could take several months and you might take periodic breaks depending on how long it's taking to purge things and just do a little bit of like maybe some demulcents and some gut healing powders and maybe some esbulardi and some, maybe some probiotics or some bacillus coagulins or something in between to kind of reseed the microbiome and strengthen the immune system. Or maybe you do things from an even immune perspective, right? Like Mm -hmm. astragalus and zinc and things to just fortify their system as you take a break and then go at it again. And sometimes it's good to also break up your antimicrobials and take pauses because then you catch a parasite, a different part of their life cycle. And you have to be smarter than the microbes because these Mm -hmm. things know how to adapt. They've been able to evade our immune system sometimes for decades before you actually become aware of their existence, right? They can form cysts and hide inside of cysts so they can evade the immune system. They can change the protein structures on their, on their external, uh, on their surface. So they can evade the immune system. They can hijack your cells and lie dormant inside cells and just like drink your nutrients and evade your immune system. So they have ways to adapt. So I don't just give the same thing for 12 months. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. changing it up every few weeks. And I might take a week break and then come at it again. Then you catch it at a slightly different life cycle. I like to think of it as like a sneak attack approach as well, right? Like that's kind of what goes on in my brain. And they're just like, they think they know what's going to happen next. And then I come back in with like a little surprise. That's kind like of the art like, of war, right? You're like, right. <laughs> it, it is the art of war for God's <laughs> right. So, so you want to be able to change it up um, and have different things in your arsenal. And it's also really important to improve how your colon is, is cleansing. And sometimes through the parasitic process, I will not sometimes, but I will recommend things like coffee enemas or colon hydrotherapy because things can hide in the folds of your colon and continue to fester. And that like, just cause you've pooped twice a day, doesn't mean you actually got rid of things. People mm -hmm. forget that. So this is where people get skirmish with me and fight me on these things. Like, I don't want to do an enema. Like, what are you asking? You're going to put coffee there. And like, what? And like, so, so people get weird around that side of things. So sometimes that's a hard sell, but it can be a really important part of the process. And I found some of my clients who are more committed to doing those things. They find they don't see parasites in their poop when they do the coffee enema. That's when they see it because it's not coming out in a formed fashion. So right. you are expelling more. You can see it. And then they're like, okay, we're, we're still not done. Let's keep on trucking. And it gives them the motivation to kind of stay the course as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, that, that could be a really pivotal thing for people to like really get momentum as well is clearing out the colon effectively just just lodge everything yeah yeah, yeah. cuz i guess it makes it like if you're if you're um you know killing and then it's going into essentially your digestive tract and being not digested but you're seeing like parts of a parasite or microscopic parasites yeah. they're not necessarily going to be in the poop like you said but maybe yeah something attached to the colon wall that we can't get out or the microbes yeah. can't get at or that yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing too, is if you've had parasites living in organ systems, I've learned this from an osteopath that they, they can deplete the natural vitality of an organ. So outside of peristalsis, which is like the movement of food through the intestinal tract, your paras your intestines have its own set of like heartbeat and vascular structure and its own vitality and life force for that organ system outside of its functional mm. movement right? It has its own. Mm -hmm. Um, and parasites can actually deplete the life force and the vitality and blood flow and neuro, you know, and sometimes affect mm -hmm. the ner ner nervous systems integration into the, into the organ. So I had a client who had liver flukes. I sent her to the, to the osteopath because we hit a weird plateau. And then the osteopath was like, her liver was so rigid. Like it wasn't moving. It wasn't. So she's like, we're working on that right now. And it's probably, and she told me that you guys checked and you were doing some cleansing for liver flukes and stuff. So uh, that's also where like the coffee enemas, because coffee in an enema supports liver function, glutathione, relaxes the common bile duct, allows for a greater purge. That's where me doing gallbladder flushes can also release parasites when I'm doing things to clear the ducts. So I have different things that I will also integrate into somebody's protocol to ensure that there's a more effective purge. Um, and then I would send them to a manual therapist to ensure that the organ systems are actually healthy and working mm. the way we want them to. So I would send them to an osteopath as well. It gets pretty integrative if you want us as, as it should be for proper and optimizing health. Um, so that could also be a part of it because they will deplete the life force. So again, if you've had a bunch hiding in your colon, how do we know your colon is actually working to expel things the way it's supposed to be if its vitality has also been maybe reduced by the presence of parasites as well? Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? Like some people have um, issues with motility causing chronic yeah. constipation. So yeah. you might get some things moving, like pl plateaus are probably very common, right? There, yes. there may be a sense in which someone will feel like, okay, well, I'm not getting as much benefit as I was when I first started, but and maybe, and I feel much better, but me, mm -hmm. but I feel like I could feel even better. Yeah. Yeah. Just integrating different materials. Just like any kind of healing process, you might hit mm -hmm. a plateau and you have to understand how to pivot and stuff and work with the client and it just becomes mm -hmm. individualized. As yeah, and then, you know, I think when I think like parasite protocol, I'm thinking like, like tinctures or herb combinations that usually yeah. have like wormwood or oregano or garlic. Yeah. But like you said, the problem is that those herbs are often repeated in every formula and the parasites may get used to them. They may be ineffective for particular parasites that you have. So there's an individual approach yeah. in even selecting, killing. Yeah. yeah, I find that one, but like I find like say black walnut capsules from Genestra versus black walnut matrix from Cytomatrix, it is still slightly different, different quantities, different potencies. So it's still a different synergistic effect. So I find that it'll still do the job or you could take a week break because almost everything has black walnut in it, which is also another thing, which I have like, I take issue with. Cause if someone comes to me with severe nut allergies, which is 
highly prominent in this world, then yeah. you have to go to custom tinctures. And yeah. then you have to start thinking outside the box and doing things differently. So, um, so, so it can get like, like, can we start making parasitic options that don't all have black walnut running through them? Um, there are other options. Like what about Vidango? What about Neem? What about, you know, like there's a lot of different things. I also brought in a product from the States called Parawan, which is Mimosa Pudica, which is a very interesting, um, herb, which swells and gels. And it basically just... I think for lack of better phrasing, like suffocates the bugs and like traps them in its gel structure and pulls them out. But it also is a bit of a colon cleanser in that sense where it can also grab onto like toxin debris and maybe old fecal matter and help bring it out as well. Mm -hmm. So I've brought that in from the States to facilitate it. And I found when I started adding that and people started seeing more worms in their poop, like that was a bit of a game changer. Three years ago, I brought it in from the States um, and mm. people, were, that's when I started having more people coming back being like, yo, I totally saw things in my poop. And I'm like, yes. So- <laughs> Such a marketing thing, right? Like seeing things in the poop. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, uh, and I, I feel like there was something else I wanted to touch base on, but I completely mm. forget. Well, so I think rotating herbs question. you're talking about and like just wormwood and, and, uh, what else were we saying? Black um, walnut, wormwood. Walnut, yeah. 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 Get, keep the liver going, stay mm-hmm. well hydrated, address your food sensitivities, make sure you're making enough stomach acid. Cause that's your first line of defense to kill anything in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> this is great. Yeah. We're like, you know, address the terrain and then for prevention, similar types of things, right? Keep the terrain healthy, maybe yearly or, or every totally. second year. Yeah. So, so when you're done, then you want to go in once, mm. once we're out of the woods on this, your, your gut is going to take a big hit, just like the art of war. There is going to be debris. There's going to be as residual issues as a consequence of die off. So you need to go in and sweep and clean. And maybe that's where you bring a binder back in and some demulcents and your GI revives and your gut healing powders and reseed the microbiome and strengthen the digestive health. Make sure that your liver and gallbladder continue to work on your behalf. Make sure your stomach acid is effective, uh, effectively like showing up for you. Make sure that your nervous system is innovating your organs. And that might be the work with the osteopath or the manual therapist. Make sure you continue to poop every day. Make sure you're not eating just like a diet full of garbage. So you create a toxic environment in your gut. We're just allows you to just throws you back to square one eventually again. But again, don't forget parasites are part of our existence, just like viruses, bacteria, yeasts, funguses, molds. It's a part of our environment. And if your defenses are lowered because of toxic burdens and already residual inflammation from all this other garbage, you've now lowered your defenses that allows these things to maybe become more problematic than they ever should have been. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good place too, to talk about like this, like there is almost this pro fragility uh, ethos in like medicine in our world in general. And it's sort of like, like I am, um, uh, you know, uh, defenseless against these like pathogens. And so I need to like sanitize and avoid and just, and keep myself clean as much as possible. Right. Whereas I think like the naturopathic approach and, and especially your approach is like be um, anti-fragile, right? Like let's make sure that we have a terrain that's like not conducive to infections and, mm-hmm. um, and, and understand that these things are a reality of living a healthy life is that if you're out in nature barefoot, that's great, but you're, you might get a parasite as well. And that's just how it is. Yeah. Our internal environment is not sterile. So our external environment should not be sterile either. Hmm. You cannot quote unquote, avoid like that's, I mean, like the, the last three years, I always found that that was to be a very funny thing when it came to germs. It was like trying to avoid them. And I was like, that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Like there are trillions of viruses in the air at a given moment. And so yeah, you, guess what you your immune system's up to. It is right? killing those bad boys off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So avoidance is not the answer. Minimizing your exposure where you can. Like if you are going to go to a country that has lower standards for hydration and they can't filter them in the water, then obviously make better choices. Don't just go drink from the stream. Like mm-hmm. le- le- critical thinking, right? We don't just think we're invincible just because like- Don't eat raw don't, fish on the beach right? or something. Yeah. Right? So yeah. so so make, make smart choices, but you also can't completely avoid this. You still need to 
live in this world and I will never deter someone from interacting with mother nature the way it was we were intended to and the way we are designed to we are supposed to be in harmony and in symbiosis with mother nature and this external world around us it's none, none of it is sterile and it interacts with every with we all are interacting in a constant state of interaction with every single microbiome um, microbe in our vicinity. And if you are in a better place, then you'll have a more symbiotic and positive interaction with those microbes. And like I said, not all parasites are going to cause like a huge depletion in your symptoms. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger question is why, right? And, yeah. and we're going to be exposed to it. And sure, do your due diligence, do a cleanse every, you know, every year or some, every two years and stuff like that. But don't just, don't just run through this world without actually thinking about how to tend to your terrain either in a much more impactful way. And don't be like me and hide from the idea with disgust and avoid the topic of parasites. <laughs> I know it's a big one. I've read that too. Yeah, I know. And then when people come in to talk about their digestion, and I was like, "Well, you might have a like," and they didn't even, parasite did not cross their mind. And I'll be like, "Well, you, there may also be something parasitic involved." And they're like, "What?" They're like, "But what? Well, how?" And I was like, I, "You're alive." <laughs> You have a pulse. <laughs> like your mother-in-law. Like all the yeah. <laughs> right. If your digestion is this compromised, there's a good chance that you've been harboring some fugitives. And we don't know if they're the cause of your downfall of your digestion or just a consequence of the downfall of your digestion, because now they've been able to latch in further. So either way, you might be harboring some fugitives. Mm -hmm. Yes. And mm -hmm. they're always like, no. I always think about the people who are dog owners and stuff. And I will like I love dogs, but I will never let them lick me on my mouth. And it's like they lick their bum. And they their nose and do. snout is literally in everything. They right? eat poo and mine yeah. sleeps in my bed. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. So, so, so there's a good chance you have parasites, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it is what it is like toxo, toxo, toxoplasma, um, mm -hmm. uh, Gandhi is very common in cat feces. So if you have yeah. cats, like there could be something there, right? Like so mm -hmm. we, we forget how pervasive these are and just cause you can't see it. And just cause it's not a tapeworm and just cause you didn't go to a third world country or, you know, a, a less industrialized country doesn't mean you weren't exposed. Yeah. This is, yeah. Any, any final thoughts, Michelle, this is great. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh my god! I take like homes, I to, <laughs> parasites. I, to, I think that was a great. I feel, like, feel like I need to be really clever right now, and I'm kind of. <laughs> no, I, I just <laughs> my last coffee is <laughs> leaving my bloodstream. I can feel caffeine. Oh my goodness! I I would say, don't underestimate the impact parasites might be having on your general health. If you feel like you're hitting a wall with your ability to crack things, crack your case open when it comes to your health concerns, then maybe we need to investigate things on a parasitic level. Mm -hmm. You're doing everything quote unquote, right, but we're still not getting the results. This might be a missing piece of the puzzle. It might not, but it could very well be a missing piece of the puzzle that can begin to propel you back on track. And, in, you know, when it comes to like healing and health, um, and it's not just going to lead to digestive symptoms and it's not just going to have diarrhea. Parasites can also lead mm -hmm. to constipation. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of people think it's vomiting, it's diarrhea, et cetera. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, what we but have that, been told that, about yeah. parasites, isn't the whole truth. And it's not because I think people are trying to withhold. I think it's just that we just don't understand. Most people just haven't gone the extra step to understand it fully. Um, there's so much more than meets the eye when it comes to what we know about parasites, what we're told and what we're willing to come to terms with when it comes to about parasites. So hiding from, hiding from it is never going to address it. So get uncomfortable, get squeamish, go through the process. And I promise you, you'll feel a lot better after. This is great. And where can people find you? Yeah. Um, I'm probably most active on my social media. Uh, my website is Dr. Mich Dr. Dr. Michelle and D.ca. Um, but in all fairness, my, my Instagram is probably my most active source of connection to people and that is uh dr michelle underscore nd so dr dot m-i-c-h-e-l-l-e dot 
um, underscore ND. Jesus, I almost said it wrong. Um, so there's that. And I also have a, my own podcast called That Naturopathic Podcast, which I have a, uh, with a co host who is also a naturopath. And we talk about all sorts of stuff. Um, if you guys ever want to tune in, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, I work in Etobicoke and in Georgetown in Ontario. Um, so if you are in the Ontario vicinity and you are interested in working on something parasitic, I also practice virtually, especially if you're not quite local to those two neighborhoods. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll have links to all that in the show notes Perfect. and that naturopathic doctor, that naturopathic pat podcast. It's a great yeah. one. I've been on it a couple of times, but way yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Before me, I wasn't yeah. on the, I wasn't on the show. We'll have to bring you back and yes. now we can have uh, me and Dave come out. Yeah. And we'll do a, a, a repeat episode. Yeah. It, it's a great <laughs> pod and uh, yeah, you guys cover lots of great topics and, and Dave's been on a couple of times. So Thank awesome. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rochelle. Take care.